Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is telescope optics. With me here in the studio is Bob Berta, a member of the Warren Astronomical Society. Bob, welcome to the program. Greetings. Yes. Uh, telescopes and telescope optics, um, important, obviously. Uh, where do we want to begin with this topic? Well, normally people would think that you would want to start by talking about the different types of telescopes, uh, but nowadays that's not really that important. What we want to talk about is the quality of the optics and the intended purpose you want to use these optics for. All right. Uh, we're going to start with the scope we have here. There's things that you want to describe first. Uh, actually, I'd like to start a little bit with uh, what I think is the most important thing in choosing a telescope and that is to pick the uh, telescope to match the, your intended use. Uh, for instance, you can uh, do visual observing, looking for deep sky objects, and for that, uh, the best bet is to buy a Newtonian-style telescope on a Dobb base, Dobsonian base. I think most of your listeners know the different types of telescopes. Um, however, if you're into things like planetary, uh, double stars, or in my case, astrophotography, that may not be a good choice. In fact, generally, if you're into astrophotography, as I am, you're better off putting all of your money into your mount, and you can get by with a relatively simple telescope. So the optics for photography aren't as critical, then, as to have a top-quality mount for tracking purposes? For astrophotography, yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, so with the uh, types of telescopes, again, we're talking reflector versus refractor. Uh, we've just mentioned for visual. But specifically for the uh, astrophotographer, what are some key things that you think they should look for? Uh, probably the most important thing, in fact, of any type of telescope used for astrophotography is uh, how rigid it is and how flex-free that telescope is. Uh, one of the biggest issues we have to face in astrophotography is eliminating the flexure uh, that flexure causes uh, stars that aren't round anymore. They become egg-shaped. Okay, so we want a, a good, steady, rigid mount. Right. And also, your telescope itself, it helps if you have a telescope that's very rigid. That's one of the advantages of a refractor telescope because it's very rigid. Uh, you don't have to collimate it. It's really ideal for that. Uh, the other thing that's really useful is the fact that you've got such high-quality optics on a good-quality refractor uh, that you can capture extremely fine images without reverting to the giant um, apertures of other telescopes that you might use for visual. A simple telescope like this one down here is only 85 millimeter aperture, you know, roughly three and a half inches. And you can take pictures with this, which will easily surpass the best uh, visual views and go through even giant telescopes. So you don't want to really put a lot of money if you're an astrophotographer into giant telescopes, get high quality ones. Again, you're using your CCD camera to acquire the light with a smaller aperture that we would need a larger one for visual since our eyes don't accumulate the light like a, a camera would. That is correct. Okay, anything uh, specific that we want to uh, talk about on this scope, some of the features well, and benefits? We're going to talk a little bit about during this talk uh, how you determine how good of a telescope you have. Um, and there are a couple of ways to do that, but one of the most important things is um, any telescope can be uh, lessened in this quality by any single uh, negative thing in that whole tr optical train. For instance, you can have outstanding optics down here, uh, but for instance, if you have things like a focuser that's not in line with the optical system, um, if you have uh, a poor quality mirror on your diagonal back here, if you have smudged mirrors, all these things can severely impact the quality of your telescope. Fingerprints on the eyepieces? Yep. 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 Okay, so uh, with this one right here, uh, this looks like a, a fairly rigid setup. The, uh, the whole train itself is in line. Uh, mm -hmm. We yes, would find that particular, say if we went with a, a cheaper offshore type telescope or a a poorly made one, we would find more of those flexure problems? Right. Uh, generally, with a cheaper, poor quality telescope, you're not going to have the rigidity, the optical quality. But that being said, a lot of the new telescopes that are coming out from overseas, from China, uh, Japan, uh, I'm not talking about the high quality Japanese, but the lower quality Japanese, 
are actually very good telescopes. In fact, those telescopes just a few years ago would have been considered the, you know, the peak of perfection. So they've gotten it down to a science. They can make very good telescopes. Interesting. Now, uh, for the optics on this one, uh, the, there's various types of glass that are used in both the lenses and uh, in the mirrors and eyepieces? That is correct. Uh, this particular telescope is a apochromatic telescope, which means it has a higher quality glass. And a term that they use is SD or ED glass, which is sort of a, um, a term that you know, people have come to associate with really high quality scopes, but it's a misnomer because that's not really a good way to determine how good of a glass or how good of a quality you have. What Look, would be a good way? A good way is if you can get the actual uh, the, the scientific description of how good that particular optic is. Uh, there's two ways of doing that. Number one, using what they call a Streil ratio, S-T-R-E-H-L. And this is a uh, ratio that determines how high quality that glass is. Um, and these, uh, these terms are only going to work for the primary objective. But as you work down through your whole telescope, throughout the whole uh, train, optical train, you can reduce that quality. Um, for instance, as I mentioned before, if you have a you know, lower quality mirror, if you have a poorer quality diagonal, if your uh, uh, focuser is not aligned with the telescope, you're going to reduce the quality of that. And a better, I guess you might say, a better measure of how good your overall telescope is, a term, the short term is MTF, which is modulation transfer frequency. And this is a way of determining how the overall telescope, how good of a performer it is. Is there a way to describe that uh, briefly for our um, Actually, I would not do it here. What I would recommend doing, there's a book, which I consider the Bible of uh, astronomical telescope testing. Uh, it's called uh, Star Testing Astronomical Telescopes by <coughs> Harold Richard Souter. Uh, this is the original edition. Uh, the original edition uh, went out of print for a couple of three years, and it has come back about a year ago. And it's a very good There's book, also so I'd recommend that highly if you're interested. The this, as you can see, is a thick book. It takes about three or four reads to learn all the tricks about how to determine how good of a telescope you're looking through. But once you do, uh, you can take any telescope within There's also three or four seconds, aim without a bright star, and use the techniques in here. You can determine how good your telescope is or what defects that telescope has. It's really important to realize that when you talk about defects in a telescope, uh, no telescope objective is perfect. Oftentimes, uh, there are some concessions made, and those concessions can reduce the quality, uh, but a lot of times you'll accept those concessions because you'll get other things you want. And these defects, they would be more apparent with astrophotography than with visual viewing? That is correct. Uh, for instance, a telescope used uh, visually, like a refractor like this one, and if you're looking at not very bright objects like the moon or bright planets, uh, oftentimes it works just fine. Uh, when you get into astrophotography, though, you want to get into a very fast optic, which allows you to capture images in short time. And to do that, it uh, really pushes the telescope maker's skills to make a telescope that can be very fast and still remain high quality. That is why you have these apochromatic scopes. Uh, on the other hand, if you're visually using a telescope and you don't need that very fast speed, you can achieve the same uh, end by going to a long telescope, a long focal length. Instead of a telescope like this one at f7, you could extend that out to an f15, a very long telescope, which will pretty much eliminate the need for an apochromatic scope. It'll work great for visual, but not for photography. Okay, so in other words, the uh, various wavelengths of light will come more into focus with that longer focal length. That's right. That's correct. This has been a, a very interesting discussion. I know we have some other topics that we uh, want to cover in the second part of uh, this discussion. We're going to take a uh, quick break. Uh, if you have a question for us about uh, this particular topic for this month's show or any other question for that matter, uh, you can send us an email. You can see the address down there at the bottom of your screen. And right after Term of the Month with Steve Witte, We'll be back with more on telescope optics. The term of the month for November 2013 is diffraction. I'm going to start with a quote by Richard Feynman. Uh, he was a Nobel laureate and a physics professor. He says, 
No one has ever been able to define the difference between interference and diffraction satisfactorily. It is just a question of usage, and there is no important physical difference between them. He then went on to say that when there are only a few sources, say two, we will call it interference. Now, for telescopes, every point that you're looking at in the telescope, the entire image area, if you will, is a point source. So for telescopes, diffraction is a fact of life. And what diffraction does is it makes images less sharp. So we would like to make them sharper. All right, so this plot shows the area disks for a point source for an ideal telescope. Uh, most of the energy, the, this white area in the center, is where most of the energy goes. So the bigger this white area in the center, then the bigger your stars look like in a telescope. And uh, they're also, the bigger they are, uh, the energy is then spread over a, longer, a larger area, and they're dimmer. So uh, you want to minimize diffraction for both sharpness and brightness. Each of the rings then contributes light to nearby points in your image. So you want to minimize those as well. So there's a formula that this image uh, was computed from, and it looks like this. And the details are not very important. There are two things that are kind of important. One is that this formula, believe it or not, means that bigger aperture, that's the bigger diameter of the biggest lens or mirror in your telescope, bigger aperture gives you smaller rings and a smaller point in the center. And the J, it says 2J in the, in the top there, um, the J is a Bessel function. And what that does is it means that uh, the farther you are from the center, uh, the less the total effect is. So it, gets, it fades with distance from the center. So those are the two things. So that was diffraction, the term of the month for November. 2013. <laughs> Welcome back to our program. The topic <clears throat> that we're continuing for this month's show is about telescope optics. Discussion with Bob Verda here from the Warren Astronomical Society. So Bob, what are some of the uh, issues that uh, one could run across then uh, that we wanted to discuss about with the scope or things to look for? Right. Uh, one of the things we mentioned earlier was uh, any drop in the uh, factors that can impact your total optical train are things that can degrade the image quality. But not only that, even if you have an absolutely perfect telescope, everything is set up right, there's a lot of other things that do impact that. Things like uh, the cooling. You know, if you take your telescope from your nice warm house outside, set it up, uh, you're not going to get a good image for at least an hour, hour and a half. So you've got to let it cool down. Those uh, lenses or mirrors have to reach that ambient temperature? Right, yeah. They call it thermal equilibrium. And that's very important. In fact, in a few seconds we'll talk about testing. And the testing, you're wasting your time if you try to do that you know, without letting it cool down. Uh, there's other things that can happen. For instance, if your temperature is changing during the night, for instance, uh, you know, if you've got wind gusts and the temperature is constantly raising or lowering during the night, you're going to be chasing your tail trying to get good optical performance. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that the atmosphere itself severely impacts the quality of your images. For instance, uh, uh, if you're at higher altitude, that's a blessing. You, at high altitude, unlike what we have here in Michigan, right. uh, that's a big advantage. I have a friend that has an observatory at 6,000 foot. He has pristine images from that. Um, on the other hand, you can also have major problems with the moisture in the air. Uh, we all know about our the Michigan Near Earth Nebula clouds, right. a, and we can right. have thin clouds, and actually, sometimes those can actually slightly improve your, your resolution. Very, very thin um, for, if you're looking at planets and moon type of pictures. Uh, but those are things that do make a difference. And the fact of life is that in a given year, if you could observe every single day in a year, if you're lucky and live in New Mexico or Arizona, there's still only a handful of days in an entire year that will actually support the absolute top uh, optical performance of your telescope. Uh, factors such as moisture in the air, dust in the air, uh, the weather conditions, uh, I suppose a high pressure system or a low, air currents rising and lowering. Even people 
touching your telescope, uh, people standing in front of your telescope, heat coming off of roofs down the line. Uh, many times you can actually see this if you go out and take a telescope that has very good optics, look in it and just touch the side of the telescope and in your image, if you put a little bit out of focus, you'll, all of a sudden you'll see the image distort. And that's the heat from your hand transferring into that telescope and you know, disturbing that image quality. Oh, my. Uh, well, let's take a look at this. I know you wanted to show our uh, viewers uh, a couple of the features of uh, this scope right. here. Uh, one thing, when you're getting uh, parts for a telescope accessories, you do want to get high quality. Uh, generally, I can just about guarantee that the standard uh, uh, diagonal that you get with your standard off-the-shelf telescope is very low quality. Uh, that's probably the first thing you should upgrade. Uh, trade in your stock one and get a high quality one from any of the main manufacturers. Uh, this one is from Astrophysics, which is a very good uh, company to deal with. Uh, this telescope is made uh, by Teleview. They also have very good ones, and there's many other brands. This particular one has an unusual thing, which actually I had custom built. And this is a two inch to one and a quarter adapter. Unlike most adapters, which push from one side to hold your eyepiece in, this one is squeezes equally in all areas. So it perfectly centers that eyepiece in the chain of your optical uh, line of sight, you might say. And for reasons you know, that you'll soon find out, if you start doing really high quality, high magnification imaging, you'll see this. You'll actually see that image quality go up as you get everything perfectly aligned. So having that eyepiece or where you're going to put your CCD camera perfectly centered on that uh, light path. Yep. In fact, uh, on CCD cameras, often uh, any slight, you might say, sag or vertical tilt on that camera can make a severe difference in image quality. And some of the better telescopes now either have very strong uh, ways of connecting those cameras, and some telescopes even have uh, ways of tilting slightly that camera so you get it perfectly aligned because you want to have absolutely perfect alignment because you want stars sharp in all the corners. If you start having one of the corners getting soft, you obviously don't have good alignment. All right. Anything else uh, to point out? Well, that's pretty much for this, but I did want to talk about uh, lens testing of a telescope. Um, we often think that, well, if you want to test a telescope, you have to go to a professional you know, telescope tester. In reality, you can do that yourself. And really, the way you test a telescope is to put it out of focus. We have on the screen now uh, some pictures. These are the equivalent of perfect optical performance on three different types of telescopes. Uh, one of them is at the top is a refractor. The second one down is a Newtonian telescope. And the third one is a schmidt cassegrain telescope. Uh, the perfectly focused, sharply focused image is the one in the middle on both sh all three shots. Uh, the ones on the left and the right are progressively to get it farther and farther out of focus. And the ideal image quality would have the image inside and outside of focus at the same point, maybe a fifth of a turn of your focuser, so they look identical. All right. Uh, do we have other image showing less than ideal? Yeah, we do have a, some others here. Uh, the other images will show uh, slow degradation of the images. Um, on the, this first one here at the very top, uh, is the telescope which has a one-eighth wavelength, uh, you know, which is a, considered a very good telescope. A one-eighth wavelength is very good. Uh, as you go down, you'll start seeing at the quarter wavelength, which is the middle line of pictures, uh, they don't look the same on both sides. They're getting farther and farther out. If you go all the way down to a half wavelength, a half wavelength would normally not be acceptable. And you'll see that not only do the images um, not look the same on both sides, when it's sharply focused, you'll start pushing some of the light out of your star, your sharp star, into the diffraction rings and you'll start losing your resolution. And there are ways you can test this. Us using that book we mentioned earlier, you can go through that book and it'll tell you how to check not only for things like this, which is uh, uh, spherical aberration, which means you're under or over curvature of the mirror or the optical surface. You can also determine if you have things like a rough surface, uh, if you have pinched optics, things that are squeezing your mirror. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things will tell you that you've got a problem and oftentimes you can correct it just by knowing what you have. You can correct it. That's great. In the few minutes that we have left, Bob, is there anything else that you'd want to impart to our viewers about the optics of a telescope? Yeah, um, probably the most important thing is that there is no perfect telescope. So don't chase your till trying to get the absolute perfect telescope. Also, don't fall into the, uh, I guess, the image uh, that 
I can have a better telescope than you because mine has a slightly better performance, so therefore mine is a better telescope. In most cases, as we mentioned, that you can only get this type of optical quality in a rare number of days a year. You'll never see that. And it's sort of like hi-fi. I remember a few years ago they said, well, I can have this certain frequency I can hear with, and this, this radio uh, speaker system can reproduce that. Well, in reality, your ear can't hear any of those differences, so you're fooling yourself. It might look good on paper, but it's not going to really show up in, in actual, actual things you can actually visually see or test with your, with your equipment. Is there a website that would be helpful to our visitors? Uh, yeah, there is a good website. This website, which I'd recommend very highly, um, is... Um, you know, it is uh, HTTP, you know, uh -huh. colon, forward slash, forward slash, telescope-optics.net, forward slash. And that particular uh, website will give you more information than you could ever possibly need about all the different types of telescopes. It tells you how they're made, how they work, uh, the optical advantages and disadvantages of them. And also, the one thing which is now the new big deal now is that all these telescope optics can be corrected. For instance, many of these designs all have inherent problems. For instance, a Newtonian telescope or a Dahl Kirkham telescope has inherent issues, but now they use optical correctors. And so a telescope like a Dahl Kirkham, which normally has a problem with the coma on the edges, with a corrector that can eliminate that and take advantage of it, what it does have is a very flat field. So a telescope like a Dahl Kirkham that's been corrected will give outstanding performance visually and also for optical. Uh, use for photography. That's great. Uh, I want to thank my guest uh, for being here with us today. Uh, again, Bob Berta from the Warren Astronomical Society. Uh, we'll talk with the producers, see if we can't get that website in the credits somewhere uh, so that you can reference that and uh, check it out to help address any issues you may have with uh, your light path. Uh, if you would like more information, please go to our website. Uh, we have the address down there at the bottom of your screen. We'd uh, love to have you visit. And coming up next is What's Up in the Night Sky with Steve Woody, so don't go away. What's up in the night sky for November 2013? Uh, first of all, we have a meteor shower every November, the Leonid meteor shower. This year, unfortunately, it falls right after the full moon, which is November 17th. So it's not going to be an ideal year for the, the, for the Leonids. It'll be cold, of course, dress warm if you're going out. You can see meteors any night of the year, you'll see a lot more during a shower like the Leonids. Uh, the month starts out on the 3rd with a new moon. 
So a new moon is great for watching things that aren't the moon, because the moon is more or less by the sun, and you really can't see it very easily. On, on the 3rd of November, we have the first quarter moon. On the 17th, the full moon. The 25th, the third quarter. So the third quarter is uh, uh, a midnight and on event. The full moon is all night. The first quarter is, um, it, starts, it starts the day and uh, ends at midnight. Sunrise for the month is around 7.30, and it sets around 5 p.m. Jupiter rises around 9 p.m. in the constellation Gemini. Uh, Jupiter is uh, really bright. It's really hard to miss. You can actually use Jupiter to find Gemini this month. Venus sets around 8 p.m., but November 1st is kind of interesting. It is the greatest elongation day. So this is when uh, Venus is farthest from the sun, and therefore it is highest in the sky after sunset. So it's a great month for Venus. Saturn is in superior conjunction on November 6th. There's no image for it because it's going to be behind the sun from us. So you're not going to see Saturn this month. Uran Uranus and Neptune are visible, but you're going to need a telescope and a decent finder chart for them. Uh, this is a good month to see Uranus naked eye if you really know where to find it. Uranus sets at 3.30 a.m. and Neptune sets at about midnight. So in this finder chart you can see uh, that Neptune is in Aquarius and uh, Uranus is in Pisces. So um, you'll really need to know the constellations as well as where the planets are in them. Um, so this month, we should see Comet Ison, that is, if it survived its pass by the sun. At the time of taping at this show, we have no idea, because it hasn't really come around the sun yet. But by the time you're watching this, it'll either be a great comet, or it'll have totally busted. Um, but if it is, if it does survive, then right around 6 a.m., uh, it'll, it should be between Mercury and, in, and Mars in the constellation Virgo. That's if it survived. We're all hoping that Ison is a great comet this year. So that's what's up uh, for November 2013. Keep looking up. It's the greatest free show above the Earth. <laughs>